here we go. Let me, uh... Really make sure this is... Good to go. I have a noise gate on right now to make sure. The air conditioner is, like, cranked. So I don't want to get a bunch of air conditioner noise and... All that stuff. So it's like trying to find the right balance. And my microphone is up above me right now. Kind of moving stuff around, as it were. Let me, uh... See, there it is. There he is. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, I got my mic up here. I had it down here. It was catching me breathing. It was doing a bunch of weird stuff. And uh, I don't know if you guys saw the Diablo 4, the closed beta. Uh, before they did the open beta, they did like a closed beta test for uh, people that were or early access beta or whatever they called it. And it was a good episode, but the mic kept slightly cutting in and out because I had it positioned in a weird way. So I'm going to try to mess with this to make sure stuff sounds good. Um, also, let me turn my music down right here. And then whenever we uh, get to me painting, I'm going to swivel this around to, to face me as well. So hope you all are doing good. We have a uh, swamp. I'm, I'm wanting to do more landscape work. And I'm wanting to do more creative landscape work. Um, namely for like a D&D &D style client, Magic the Gathering land card type stuff. Um, I have a natural, I have more of a natural knack for landscapes. I'm trained, that's what I'm like trained in, is how to do a la prima painting and landscapes and still lifes and stuff. So uh, I'm gonna start embracing that a little bit more and really kind of fine tune that skill set over the next year or so. Um, so yeah, we did a little bit of photo bashing, did a little bit of stuff in here, but a lot of this, a whole lot of this is just paint. It's not, I, I just put in some photo textures before we went live and I'm gonna integrate those and kind of paint over them and stuff. So uh, that's what we're pretty much gonna be doing. I also have um, the colors pretty much figured out. So. The colors, we're going to fine tune them. We're going to put some heavy saturation on some stuff. Uh, we're just going to tweak and finish this off. Um, it feels okay. I, I like some parts of it, but I do have to control my values a little bit and stuff. So that's what we'll talk about while we're painting. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to be painting in black and white. And then at the very end, we're going to turn the color back on, fine tune where the color is situated and how it's hitting. And then... We're going to crank the saturation up a little bit in a few places, but I want to kind of keep it muggy and like gothic-y. Um, I think that's a cool look. And, you know, it's nice to have kind of a gothic style swamp in your portfolio because you never know. Um, a whole bunch of companies love that type of stuff. So you're anything from Diablo to Dark Souls to Path of Exile to D&D &D and magic and, you know, any fantasy, anything is gonna have some swamp area. Um, so it's a, it's a safe bet. <laughs> so let's figure... Let's put that down a little. Okay. And then let me pivot this over. I got windows all over the place um, <laughs> across my three monitors. So I'm gonna... Let me mute this. Um, because I'm going to be manipulating it, and I don't want it to make any weird noises on you guys. So I'm going to mute it real quick, push it over, and then we'll get started.
All right, there we go. So it's over here. It's facing this direction now. And it is probably going to pick up a little bit of the uh, stylus pen getting close, but it is what it is. Like I said, we're going to figure it out. We're going to keep tweaking. That right there. Move my chat over here. All right. So yes, the goal of this stream is to finish this. I've already been working on it for about four and a half hours, maybe. Um. So really just kind of fine-tuning the stuff. As it goes further back, it's a little more, like, dusk and fog and just grime. So that's what I think we will be able to uh, really embrace. Kind of really embrace that. So I need to correct some of these values, I think. Uh, some of them are jumping out at me. So, quick uh, tip. If you're making a landscape, there is... Uh, the way I've heard it called is if something is waving at you. So, perfect example is like if you just kind of focus on one area, maybe on, let's say, your focal point. And you just look at that area. If anything in your peripheral vision jumps out at you and starts like waving at you, like pay, pay attention over here, you kind of want to correct those values um, because you want to make sure that the focal point stays the focal point and you don't have a bunch of other stuff jumping in. So like, I think the focal point is kind of, um, I can think it's like this, like right here. Um, just kind of, I want you to come into the landscape. So I don't want a lot of stuff in focus down here. And I also don't want stuff in focus in the back. My real focal points should be kind of right here. Um, but right now, because I did put in the photo textures, the photo textures are way taking over. They're way sharper than everything else. And they don't make a lot of sense. So... That's my main corrective thing. I'm gonna grab this uh, Photoshop wet brush. This is Clip Studio Paint Volume 2 or Version 2 that we're gonna be using all stream long, by the way. We're not gonna jump into Photoshop. We're not gonna do any of that. We're just gonna straight up uh, just paint using Clip Studio Paint. So I, I'm gonna do this, and I know it's a weekday. I know it's a weird time for a lot of people, so. We may not have a ton of chatters um, live, but that's okay. I will still give advice and all that because I know a lot of people really like watching the archive. And if you're here watching the archive, thank you very much. I'm very happy to have you. And I hope that I give some like cool tips and tricks that can help you with your landscapes. But yeah, landscapes are kind of my comfort food. I, I'm way more comfortable doing landscapes than I am doing, like, character design. And I think I've started trying to stretch myself too thin by trying to do a little bit of everything. Um, creatively. So, when that's the case, usually it's better to really focus on the thing that you want to focus on just really get good at the thing. And I think landscapes will be my thing. I just have to practice more at them to get them to a level to where clients would want to hire me specifically for landscape work. So I do apologize if you hear a lot of like click, 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 thud, thud, thud because the microphone's right next to the uh, <laughs> right next to the monitor but like I said we'll figure it out we'll figure out these little things so what I'm doing my goal in my mind like my mind's eye 
this tree, like this trunk right here, or the, I guess the big thick branch is like going into the background a little bit, not at a 45 degree angle or anything. Like it's not that drastic, but it is kind of going more in to the background. So I need to start matching the values to make that shape make sense. So like grab this like lighter color, you know, this is why working in value at first is so nice is because you can nail this down first and then kind of work from there. So I want to bring this up and like, and then, yeah, like right around here is where I want it to kind of darken up. Like maybe not that dark, but So this is a really nice brush. This is from the Ray Frendon brushback uh, for Clip Studio. And it comes with like a thousand brushes. And I use maybe 15 of the brushes in the whole pack. They're all fantastic. But I found my ones that I like. And it's part of Photoshop, um, F-A-U-X, like fake Photoshop. Photoshop wet and basic Photoshop. You know, no soft or opacity or nothing like that. These are the two that I really use to render. And I love it. Um, the wet one just blends really well. It's a natural feeling. And then Photoshop. This one's a little more abrasive. Um, it's more of kind of the... It's like just your basic uh, sharp brush, but it still has a little bit of painterly edge to it. It's it's hard to explain because basically, if you look at the pictures down here, it's all a basic hard round brush. But there's something different. This works a little differently than the ones in Photoshop. I actually prefer these to the ones in Photoshop, which is why we're just going to stick around in Clip Studio like all night tonight. And grab that one. Yeah, this is great for like sharper. Mm, do I want that to fling around? push it back. So really the rules that I'm following, something's darker, it's closer. If it's lighter, it's further away. That's really the only thing I'm worried about right now. Like even the shapes and stuff. I have some um, reference images of some big trees with big branches and stuff. So I'm going to bring those up in a little bit. But right now it's more... Uh, Oh, it's Phoenix, my man. The man with the plan, Phoenix. What's up, bro? Um, so I'm going to bring in the other pieces to kind of look at, to kind of get the right texture for this tree bark and things like that. But otherwise, we're just kind of following that rule. We're following the rule of if it's lighter, it's further back. Like it, it recesses into the back. And if it's darker, it comes up closer to the viewer. And that's it. That is it. Easy peasy. Like if you're if you're wanting to start learning how to do landscapes, this is a really easy rule to follow. And you can make oh, you can make a career just following that one rule. Um it doesn't mean it's right. But it is very workable, um, especially if you have like a new brush set you want to try out and stuff. Doing a landscape like this is is a pretty cool way to work because there's no pressure really. Trees and rocks and stuff can kind of look however you want them to. 
they don't have to look exactly like a thing, um, which is kind of liberating because you have less of the worry that you're gonna like make some big mistake. Because it's not, you know, nature is weird. Nature is not an exact formula. It's not. It's not something that you really need to worry about too much. You just want interesting shapes. You want good forms. And the way we're going to render out some of these forms is what I like to call the saran wrap method. And the saran wrap method is basically another term for contour lines. Lines that um, explain the shape and, and like not the, f well, kind of the form, but the lines that actually, like, you may have heard of, like, the spiral, and, like, make the spiral, you know, make the spiral, if it starts off big, and then you make the spiral, like, smaller, it looks like it's going away from you, or, um, there's a lot of them, um, you know, a lot of people also say, you know, if you want to, you can, like, just make blocks about what you know like what area and then like connect your blocks and stuff so basically how your shapes are kind of there and then what you would do perfect example is like right here let me bring this in let me adjust some of these real quick and then what you would do if I wanted to lighten up and put some texture into that, I would do it with contour lines or basically how would I render this if I was wrapping it in saran wrap, like to, to ship it out somewhere. What I would probably do is I would grab a light color and I would follow the form of how I see it. Um, I've also heard this called marching ants. Like if it's a line of ants, crawling across something, like follow their path. Um, that's usually a good way to do it as well. But then if you slowly start introducing some of this type of work, you know, kind of like wrapping around, wrapping around the shape, you're going to start noticing that the forms read a whole lot better than if you did not do that. And you don't want to go the same direction as the limb. You want to go, what is that, perpendicular, where you cross it. Like, So if it's going out, you want to go across and explain to the viewer what shape they're looking at. And, you know, like right here, it's still a little gaudy, still a little heavy-handed. But what you can do is that's whenever you can really mix and match your values. You can take some of the bigger ones, break up that shape, break up some of these, break that up. You can apply the shadow. You know, whatever is not facing the light does not get the light, so to speak. Let me make these good. Uh, uh, Um, negative shapes, I guess. See, that one's a little too big. It really, it's just about making these shapes interesting. Not even realistic. I don't even care about that. I just want the shapes to be interesting for your eyeballs. Because that's way more important in a landscape, in my opinion than having something that looks absolutely correct. Um, I don't really care all that much about something being correct or not. That's why landscapes work so well. It's way more important that it looks cool.
And another piece of theory that's really cool about doing these, you can kind of checkerboard where you have light on dark, on light, on dark, on light, on dark, and you can keep doing that over and over. But what's cool is it's all relative to the thing it's next to. Yeah, rule of cool is kind of the best philosophy. The more experience I get doing this, the more I realize that the rule of cool is kind of the thing. Um, like a majority of clients is especially your bigger clients. You know, your anatomy should be pretty right. Your, your, your perspective should be pretty right. It should be believable, but it doesn't have to be realistic. And, uh, if you're getting the, the mood across, that's way more important. See, we're just kind of like, going to be a lot of this, this stream, a lot of, uh, going in and warping and maneuvering and it's really in just kind of cleaning up edges and blending them into other edges and make that something that's pretty cool because yeah it'll be real easy to add that color in because we'll just like activate it we just want to make sure that the values read well and then um we can go in and we can really fine tune so i'll show you while we have this up right here let me Go ahead and say I'll show you guys what we're working with so I wanted um, to make a piece very much in the style of Warhammer so Warhammer has a game which is really cool called Warhammer Underworlds it's a board game you get really good uh, miniatures and stuff but what's really cool about the game is all the game boards, they basically make these cool, uh, I don't know, like locations and locales. And uh, before I bring this over, let me actually get a few Google image searches of the game board so you guys can kind of see what I mean. For the reference or I say reference um this is called the gnarl wood and this is what they have in their most recent expansion um so it's technically Warhammer Underworlds is more of like Age of Sigmar it's Warhammer Fantasy the newer Warhammer Fantasy stuff but it's weird Underworlds it's kind of its own thing um, I think really what it is, is it's designed to be able to take, it's almost an on-ramp to Warcry, which is the Age of Sigmar skirmish game, which is fantasy. So Age of Sigmar is fantasy, 40k is their sci-fi, and 40k has what's called Kill Team, and that's their skirmish game. Um, also, like, Necromunda does some stuff you know, Hive Planet stuff. But Age of Sigmar has Warcry. And then I think Warcry has a feeder, which is Underworlds. Because this is like its own standalone thing. Like, Underworlds, you can just buy this and never have to get into anything else Warhammer at all. And you'll still have a competitive board game. Um, 
So here's kind of what it is. And you can see here, like this is the Norwood set, which I own. I own the set. I already have it painted up and everything. Um, you can see it's all kind of the hex base, but see how they have these cool, um, just boards and the boards are double sided and you can put them together and it changes the strategies and stuff. Just a really neat idea. I really recommend, like if you want to get into mini war gaming and you don't want to spend a ton of money, but you want to have some kick-ass models with some cool lore and a cool book, this is the thing to get because like. You can play this even by yourself. Um, I have played a game of Underworld solo. It's not easy. Um, and you have to, like, shut off your brain for one of the characters, kind of. Like, you'll end up figuring out who your favorites are, and then you'll start, like, biasing your decisions based on that. But, um, but hey, it's a cool two-player game. You can just buy the one box set, and you can play this for years. Um, yes. So, what's really cool is they have... Um, this might just turn into a Underworlds uh, deal. But um, let me see what some of the cards are. <laughs> so firstly, let me show you. So here are the um, one side of the minis that came with it. And like, this is peak Warhammer fantasy. Like, I dig the Sons of Velmorn. Um, this is... I could paint and draw these forever. Like, so dope. I love how they look. Um, these, of course, look great because Games Workshop painted them, but I painted mine. They still look pretty cool. <laughs> um, and then the other true is going to be the... Uh... Oh, can't remember what they're called. Um, but yeah. They have very, very cool looks, you know. Um, but really what it is, is they have cards, and each mini has its own movement square, so you can move two spaces or three spaces, and your attack can reach two, and like... So it's a really cool tactical game. But, all that being said, their world building and, like, lore stuff is awesome for Underworlds. And I love it, love it, love it. Um, you'll see that this is very bright and saturated. Like, one of my favorite ones is this. Super cool. Like, such good art, man. It's rad. But you can see, like, the teeth of the woods. And then this is kind of an up-down shot. This is the top of their head. Like, it's a super aerial perspective. And you can see, like, the veins of the trees. It's really weird. These are like meat trees, basically. They breathe and they can eat. Um, and then I love kind of that blood red kind of meat look in the back. But you'll see here how it kind of fogs out. You know? That's kind of what we're going after. I'm going after that fog right there. Um, I do love the lighting. I just don't know if I can light mine to make sense that way. I just don't have a firm enough grasp on... I guess the location. I mean, I guess I could. Like this little area right here. It's already a little lighter, so maybe I can hit it with some highlights or something. And then kind of maybe extend this out. Maybe a good slice of light right around here. Kind of show some of the forms. But this is kind of the vibe we're after, right? Um, it's very saturated. Mine's very not saturated. Um, yeah, God, look at the difference of like saturation <laughs> super red and like super brown and stuff and then mine's very not that but eh, oh well but then there's some other stuff here are my stock images um just to get some good texture reference that way if i want to come in and start doing some detail work i can do that um and then here are two pieces. This one is by, oh, Adam Paquette for Magic the Gathering, which is beautiful. I love Adam's work. I always have. Um, genius. And it's pretty close to what we're doing. I mean, to be fair, uh, you can only do swamps so many ways. So definitely kind of seeing how he does some of his uh, 
You can tell it's photo bash, but it's still really, really well done because he integrated he integrated it very well. Um, yeah, and it's all that control of uh, values, you know. And then this is um, Andreas Roca, who I love. He's one of the heavy hitters for Magic: The Gathering land art. He always does a really nice slice of light somewhere like he'll hit something with a huge highlight and then kind of warp the rest of the landscape around it it's really cool um but it gives it a focal point i mean huh, you can put this actually both of these you can put these by themselves and like zoom all the way out and you can still kind of tell what they are even if it's really small which is for a magic card that's what you want uh, but then you zoom in and you can even see brushwork you can see Kind of the the hard round brush rendering and some of the texture kind of craig mullins sponge brushes and you know stuff like that and same thing here um it reads super strong but then whenever you zoom in you can literally see the the squiggles the the brush squiggles so that's a thing i definitely want to practice i want to practice the whole Hard round squiggle turns it into, yeah, like this, very smart. And like this, very smart. I dig it. Um, because you zoom out, it looks perfect. You know. So that's our goal. That's kind of what we're going for. But really, it's to get the, uh, this sort of storytelling in here. Yeah, maybe I could do a light shaft. And then... Have some of this hit. So, let, let's do some of that. Let's clean some of this up. And then let's do... A light hit on a new layer. Just to kind of see... Because we want it to grab attention, right? We really want it to... Pop. And I think it's working okay right now, but could be better. You know what I mean? You can always. Don't mind my adult beverage here. All right. So let's clean up. I was zoomed in here and I noticed that right there. So huh. I'm going to clean that up. Bye bye. So I'll get the Photoshop brush. It works a little better as a solid kind of a line style, yes, yeah, squiggly, see, kind of brush. So we'll do something like that. Then I did have that, some moss right here, that sort of stuff. So maybe I can take that light and maybe I can like do some big shapes. We we'll also have that rock look like that. Um, scoop that in. So I'm a little too zoomed in right now. I need to zoom out and make sure this is making sense on the bigger picture, but we do 
do something like this. Right. That's actually a great point. Um, yes. So with Photoshop especially, there are a ton of like vegetation brushes. It's actually not a bad idea. Um, thing is I don't have a lot. I have quite a few of them I think in Photoshop, but I, mm, I think I might actually, that's a good idea. And hell, that's, that is a thing that, you know, definitely helps. So if you have this. Yeah, maybe if I stay out here and like, then make it look out here like it's tree bark. Maybe that's better. And then what we can do is, let's say there's solid slice of light coming this way. So let's say it catches like and see it's going to be really pronounced here because of how dark everything else is. But maybe that's for the best. And then this will really require us to render out the form, which is actually fine. I'm fine with that. right now I'm just kind of gunning it see what we can get okay and then we'll kind of connect these together because really there just needs to be the optical illusion of like the light hitting. You see what I mean? Like it's kind of getting there. But what I really need to do, since this is going back, it should also hit, right? And like like we talked about, we're gonna do those contour lines. So like nice because I just want to keep it in almost like a square pattern or like if the light strip only goes across and it's like falling across the landscape like what plane is this and like what is it going over top of you know what I mean like so there's those kind of comes over there and it maybe hits some of these then it spruces into there hits those pretty good maybe hit some of these and I think where this is really going to make sense is uh, when I get the softer brush out and I kind of render these shapes into each other I think it'll 
think it'll work well. Let me go ahead and save. Huh. I did the mistake of doing this on the same layer, but oh well, we'll figure it out. <laughs> I should have done it on a different layer that way if I didn't like it. I can change it, but let's just make it work so I will like it. So yeah, this nice softer brush right here to kind of connect all of these together and then blend it into the darker deal, you know what I mean? Like... See how those edges, it all comes down to edges. See how now we're kind of like almost blending with the softer brush. It's still a hard round, but we're like kind of smudging those really harsh shapes out. And we're kind of bringing in some of those crazy lines. Just smudge into some of these. can kind of like uh, blur these back into the darkness. So it really does give that sense that like only the light is hitting one specific little area of it. starting to look more believable like weird but you know more uh more believable this pop what you do is you come in with a uh, go ahead and get rid of that kind of come in with a uh, big color dodge tool Brighten it up. 
up. around the edges of stuff. Yeah, right now I'm just thinking about the contours and the uh, those checkerboard lines I was talking about where you have light on dark and dark on light and you keep kind of alternating those. That does a really good job of kind of allowing you to break up shapes a lot. And it's really handy to do that. Since that light is hitting, these shadows are actually going to be cast a little more strongly. I wanted this to be kind of like a log or like a weird outcropping thing. So let's darken those shadows. Make it very kind of harsh shadows. What's up? So, Color Dodge is good to see you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, so, Color Dodge, what it does, basically it makes stuff brighter, but it saturates edges of um, value changes. So, the best way to show you what it does, let me do it in color first. So, let's say the color of the light that I wanted was like that kind of like greenish color that we have here. If I get like an airbrush and soft airbrush, make it big and then pick the color that I want. And I go to color dodge. It's going to brighten everything while also uh, multiplying the brightness by the hue over and over and over and over again. So like, if we wanted the big hit of light to be like right here, right here, right here, you see what I mean? It's really like pronounced. Um, for me, color dodge a little bit goes a very long way. This is at 100% opacity and 100, but what's funny is you see, you see what it's doing to the colors here? So it does this to the colors here. If you notice something, 
that's exactly the same effect that you're going to see on a lot of Warhammer and Magic the Gathering. A lot of it. Like, that sort of hit of light, especially like even like right here, that's how you can get a really quick hit of light, but even look at how the shadows work here, and like how this is kind of a round hit. I can almost guarantee you that's how they did it. They probably hit it there. They probably lowered the opacity of it a little bit. And then you can use this as kind of an underpainting. Um, so it works well. I mean, it does work really well. My only thing is, I can spot color dodge immediately. Like, not to say there's anything wrong with that. It's just, since I come from that sort of, hey, if you want an effect, you better paint it type of, which isn't the right or wrong way to do it, but it's just how I've learned. Um, so what I would do, really where Color Dodge works incredibly well, is like right here. You see where, um, make this smaller. You see where you have your dark foreground and then you have that light kind of coming through. Watch what happens with the effect. When I hit it with that. It really makes it look that nice foggy it, it does something. It it, it, it strips um it, it strips the harshness out of the transition, but what it does is it blows out the edges. Um so anywhere you see that sort of thing. So like we could do a small one, maybe like right there. We could do one right there. We do one right there. We do one right there. You know, it adds something, but you can start seeing it looks kind of fake. It looks like a lamp almost. It looks, to me, it looks very digital. Now, if I got rid of all of them, let, let me just go ahead and like delete that layer, delete. And then if I just did the one like right here, and I'll show you what it looks like on normal. Do something like this, bring this up. That's basically what that is. Then you get a color dodge, boom, and it blows out that highlight. You know what I mean? It's just, it's quite a bit. <laughs> it's quite a bit is the thing. Um, you can do that. You can do some of those. So really where the light is hitting, you can do that. It can really, it can really make it pop. Um, you just want to be very careful when you do it. Because it can overblow everything if you're not careful. So let's say we have that. Um, what's funny, you can even bring the color overlay over. And you'll still get the effect, but it'll tie it more in with the colors that you already had. But the powerful thing about Color Dodge, do it on, on kind of your topmost layer whenever you're coloring. Or what, like if you do a color overlay and then something else. Because it's going to integrate all of the light plus all of the color plus all the saturation plus all like... It's, it's a mathematical thing. So the more info you give it, the more impactful the, the outcome. Um, Ross draws on YouTube. You know, he's freaking world famous. But he always does his color dodge at the end and he does it like... A katana. He's like, ha 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 ha. And he'll just like whip color dodge around. But it's, it's for show on the channel. But like, he knows what he's doing. Because it is slightly blowing out those highlights. Uh, to give it that more ethereal look. 
and it works great on everything. It works great on realism. It works great on uh, like anime, manga stuff. It works great on really illustrative, stylized. Um, yeah, it just works because the math is never wrong. You just have to know what it is. Now, on the flip side, if you wanted really deep, saturated shadows instead of a colored dodge, you would do a colored burn. I hate color burn. Um, I'll show you color burn real quick. So let's say we had, um, here's a color dodge layer. Let me go to color burn. I'm going to pick this kind of red color, okay? And I'm actually going to saturate it quite a bit more. And let's say I wanted underneath this tree to be kind of a really rich red. You know, I'm going to hit the reds right there. And this is on normal. Okay. And then I'm going to go to color burn. And it's probably going to turn this all almost completely black. With a little bit of hint on the outskirts of red. Yeah. Color burn's not my favorite. I don't like it very much. Because I think it, it does the thing that I tell people not to do. And that's use black in your shadows. Don't use black in your shadows. Just what it does is it is it does two things. One, it strips the character out of the color. But it changes the temperature. So, you know, there's the old saying, this is why I, I work well or better, I should say, with landscapes. Is if you have a cool light source, your shadows are probably going to be warm. Not always. Um, and, you know, there's no one set rule that's always going to be the thing. But it's a good place to start. It's like the rule of thirds or, you know, composition triangles or whatever. Like, there's no hard, fast rule that says you have to do this. But if you're in a rut and you don't know where to get started, it's one of those tips. If you have a, a, a warm light source like the sun, your shadows are probably going to be on the cooler blue slash green side of things. However, if your light source like here is more of that yellowy, well, yellow is a weird one because it's warm. It's going to be cool, but it's going to be more of your purple. It's going to be your complementary color, um, which is going to be here. Um, I have it set up to where it's like pure blue, but it's more gray. I don't want to... Yeah, it, get, it gets tricky whenever you work with yellow. Um... That's why I actually wanted to do a nice red. Because you could do um, your complementary or cyan yellow. Um, or, yeah, cyan yellow magenta. So we can kind of use that. So maybe the maybe the, the shadows could be more of the magenta stuff. Which is kind of what we're seeing here. You know, it just it removes a lot of the fun out of it, I guess. Um, now, of course, I can maybe, like, hit this, and maybe, let's say I got purple, and I really even did it bright, like, bright purple. It's still going to darken a lot. You see what I mean? Yo, Laius, how are you? Um, sky usually affects part of it. Yes. So, all of your shadows will... You know, and you can't say always because not everything is always anything, but you're going to get bounce light. And the bounce light is going to be a mix of the light source. So like your skylight or whatever, your fill light, as it were. And then if you have an item and let's say the item's hovering. So let's say perfect example, we have a tree branch. Let's say the tree is brown. Okay. The light coming is yellow, which is kind of a bright brown in a certain way, right? It's a, that warmer, kind of neutrally sort of thing. And then it hits the ground, which is red. So whenever you get the yellow and the red together, it's going to make like an orange. Just the way the light combines, it makes an orange. So then that orange is going to influence a little bit of the underside, depending on how strongly the light hits the ground. So if it's grass, grass is very porous. 
it will take light, but not usually reflect it back out as intensely as it absorbs it. So whenever you hear an artist talk about textures or talk about material, like, oh, I'm studying materials, that's what they're really probably talking about. Sure, a sponge looks like a sponge, but a sponge really absorbs. So like, if you had a sponge here, it wouldn't reflect light the same way metal would. It just doesn't. Um, and nature is very good about absorbing things. It gets the nutrients from the light. So you might have a little bit of bounce light, but the bounce light is probably going to be more of your skylight. It's just going to fill it because the ground's not going to give you much unless there's water on the ground and water reflects everything. So there's a lot to it, right? Um, I'm probably making it sound way more complicated than it is. Basically, a good way to do things, a very easy algorithm, if you want to start messing with it and see how this works. Make your shadows the complement or the opposite on the color wheel of what your light source is, okay? Then the bounce light, make it 50% opacity of what your light source is. So, perfect example. Let's do this. Boom. Okay, so we know our light is this kind of nasty yellow color. Now, the thing is, this is not going to be very appealing. <laughs> I picked really bad colors for this demonstration. But, if you want to give something form, see the undercarriage right here of this, which is back here, which would actually, I needed to do this anyway, because this would be getting some of the light. It's far back enough that it's going to get hit from every angle. So if I come over here, let me get my Photoshop wet brush. Let me hit that. And then I'm going to do what we talked about with our contour shapes, right? I'm going to come in with a contour and see I'm actually at 100% opacity right now. And I'm kind of just hitting right here. And then same thing here. Let me kind of just on some of this, um, maybe even some of these, maybe even a little bit of that, a little bit of that, really the undersides of this stuff, because I want it to be bouncing up. So it looks a little weird right there, I admit. Let me get the, the wet brush. Let me make it bigger so it kind of forms out a little more, right? Let me mix back in that color, that, that right there. Bring this in, and then I lower the opacity. See how now that has a little bit more, a little bit more form to it. Um, of course, I can bring this back up and then actually really start wrapping it around here. And lower the opacity again. See, it doesn't have to be a lot of what the doesn't have to be like full blast just enough to catch this is going to catch some light you know what i mean um and it works it just works really well um but once you start getting into like overcast lighting has no real harsh shadows so it won't also have a harsh bounce light like yeah it, th things can get tricky um but it's fun I think that's part of the fun of making a good looking landscape or something that's kind of engaging is it's like, all right, this kind of makes sense to me. Um, I got that. Now what I actually want to do, let me get the normal color right here. I don't really like the fact that this is gray. I think that's kind of taken away a little bit. So I'm going to make this, I'm going to make these kind of shadow parts a little more of that brown 
right? Kind of hit those a little bit more. And also I'm introducing a little bit of brown in the shadows. But see, it's looking a little yellow. It's funny. It's kind of a little optical illusion thing. Um, let me make it more brown. There we go. Uh, bring more saturation out. Yeah, there we go. That's what I wanted. And kind of these darker. These darker kind of like black areas. Actually, we're going to kind of get a little more brown in those. Give them a little more personality. Rather than just kind of the drab nature of... There we go. And what I really need to do... This vegetation here... I do need to make a little more green. I'm just kind of following just the basic brush stuff we already have. Let's see, it's a little too much. There's a little too much saturation now. It doesn't make much sense why this part of this tree would be so saturated, while everything else in the painting wouldn't be. It might look okay, but I think it looks a little weird. Looks almost like a zebra stripe or something. So what we'll do, let's gray this back out. Anything I don't like, I just automatically return it back to gray as a nice neutral. And then we can get a better look. So we can grab our fog color and start hitting some more of the stuff in the back here that's further away from us with more of that fog color. Really start making it kind of monochromatic because that's what you'll see in a lot of Warhammer art. Let me see. A whole bunch of Warhammer art is... There we go. I mean, literally, I can tell in the background here for this piece, they had a red and white gradient. They, they had a gradient map, and they gradient mapped it, and then they started blending into it to kind of bring in... But yeah, perfect. That's another great example, if you look at these, of that bounce light. That's how they can get away with that. Um, so the secret to Overcast, in my opinion... And I think James Gurney talks about this in his book. Everything is just the color it is. There's no weird lighting. There's no harsh rim light. There's no... It's like if it's a red apple, it's red. And then you can do a little soft blend stuff here and there. But like... It's not really gonna affect too much. You know, your, your, your fill light is so diffuse that it's even everywhere. Right? So everywhere is going to get hit with the same amount of light. So whatever your light color is, you can mix that same amount. So like 10% of your light color. Um, can kind of influence the entire piece, you know. <laughs> and like perfect example. Like this is, I can almost guarantee you they started on this with a gradient map. I can almost guarantee it because these are very subtle shifts, which is fine, I dig it. I'm using gradient maps way more now than I was before. And I'll show you why real quick. Let me, uh, oh, boom, boom. Let me show you something. Let me make a new layer. Let's say we wanted to see how this would look with a hit of blue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. The clouds are blocking all of the light. All of the harsh light that would give you a ton of shadows, like the super scorching hot sun and all this other stuff, it's not there because everything's gray. 
Like, everything's grayed out. Um, like, honestly, I would think this is kind of overcast because there's not a lot of light hitting stuff, which is also kind of weird that we would have a slice of light like this. It doesn't make much sense, but it looks cool. So, like, all right, you know, <laughs> it is what it is. Um, but going back on the, the color of, of sky and how it influences everything, I'll show you a real quick trick to change your color temperature just to see if it brings you some new ideas. Let's say we wanted to bring in a nice blue, kind of maybe this blue. Okay, kind of a mid-tone, mid-value blue. I'm gonna color, um, color layer, brand new color layer. I'm gonna fill with blue, okay? So, once again, because we work on our values, any color shift that we do is going to work. Um, it's just going to look cool, right? Ironically, this is cool. Uh, <laughs> so let's say we want to introduce this blue color into every other color we already have on. Oh, thank you, Rick. I uh, appreciate you hanging out, man. Yeah, you bet. Um, so the Ryan Panko stuff is awesome. We could talk all day about it, but have a good night. Or morning, I should say. But thank you so much for hanging out. Uh, it's good to see you. So, let's say we want to introduce this. The best way to mix this in is just make a color layer of the color you want. And then lower the opacity. Let's bring this down like 20%. 20%. Okay. Doesn't look like it made much of a difference. Then you shut it off. And you realize that it made a world of difference, you know. It's that little bit, because everything is warm in our painting, whenever we introduce a cool color, it brings it back. It's pulling it back to the middle of the color wheel. So it's graying it out, quote unquote graying it out. Because you're going from yellow to blue. So it's like pulling in. So let's say you wanted it to be pretty cool. Let's bring this up to 50%. Now, we have the personality of the kind of yellow greens here. But then you also have the slight warmer purples, but it's just ever so slight, right? And then if you want to get real crazy and do something, Let's say we like how that looks. Let's say we want to lower it. Oh, let's say we want to higher or like heighten this a little bit. And then we're going to mask it out. So, Clip Studio, a mask. Um, you hit the E button for eraser. So we have this. If we really want to sell that light hit, check this out. We're just going to erase the parts where the light is. And then where some of the light is on this background. And watch what happens. It looks insane. It doesn't make sense. Our brain won't make sense of it. Because there's nothing telling us that this should be happening. Right? I'm just going to kind of erase some of it a little bit. But like, the harsh parts are here. And see how we were worried that what we had was slightly unsaturated? Look how saturated it is now compared. Because you have this very crazy brown against blue. And like the pop is unreal. So then you can like come in here and kind of introduce this back in a little bit. Like only in the... But look how freaking saturated that yellow is. It's like garish. You know what I mean? It just doesn't... Ugh, it doesn't work. It doesn't look good anymore. Um, the subtle stuff, man. It's, it's real subtle how that stuff can work. If I delete the mask... Bring this... Actually, like a little bit of the blue to temper it a little. So it kind of pulls it in, right? 
So yeah, um, this color idea, I'm actually writing up the next color theory course that I'm doing. If you look up the term mother color, um, or key color, or but I know it as mother color, you're taking a specific, basically a paint, uh, like a paint cue, and mixing that cue with every other color on your palette. So that's kind of what we're doing here, right? We're taking this blue and we just added 20% blue to every color on our canvas. But now it's up to 60% blue on every color. There's still differences. If you look real close, you can see it's more brown and more green and more yellow. So it's about that control. And what's really nice, <laughs> here's why you shouldn't be afraid of color, especially in kind of a digital uh, realm. I'm gonna do something which is gonna, you're all gonna yell at me, but it's fine. Um, it's just an example. I'm gonna turn this back to grayscale. Right. I'm going to turn that off. I'm going to make a new color layer. And I'm going to pick the most hideous colors I can think of. Okay. So let's do this orange. Oh god, this is going to be bad. <laughs> I hope my theory is correct. Let's hope our theory is correct. So now I'm going to outline all the uh so let's say okay whenever you're a little kid right whenever you're in art class or whatever it's like oh the trees the trees are all brown so i'm gonna pick a brown color i'm gonna color all my brown bam, bam, bam. Get the brown Get this brown here Get this brown, bring this up, and it built it into the rock, but that's fine. And then, okay, you know that, okay, cool. Oh, and the grass, well, the grass has to be green, because all grass is green, you know? So I'm gonna get the green. I'm gonna color all this grass. Even though this is actually a tree trunk, I'm still gonna color it like grass, like it's a hill. Right, oh, and this has some grass on it. And that has some grass on it. And this. And then, okay, so we have those. And then, yes, this is, this is grade school the apple is red, the sky is blue. Oh, speaking of, well, we gotta have a blue sky. Blue sky, so all the areas where the sky is hitting is gonna be blue. And then, what's in between? We'll use a little bit of color theory. We won't go all goofy. What's in between the brown and the blue? If that's brown and that's blue, and the stuff in the background is going to match more of the color. Let's make this purple. Alright? So we're going to make this purple. <laughs> we're going to make it purple. Alright. Because that's our transition color, you see. Because we know color theory. And yeah, I can be more exact with the... Uh, staying in the lines or, you know, whatever. But, this is what we have, oh, well, we gotta make it, ooh, let, let's make this more red up front. Kind of more, because it looks cooler. Alright, then we got that, a little bit of green. Yeah, and then let's do the nice thing, and kind of pick all of my colors and kind of blend them in, so it, like, gradients them out. Let's just do that, make it a little softer, so it's not as garish, you know? Now this looks preposterous. This looks... 
<laughs> this looks horrible. All right. Oh wait. Oh, forgot it. Forgot this. Can't forget that. Okay, good. Right. So we got our colors. Ta-da! Here's our colors. Whenever I activate this blue, I'm gonna cr I'm gonna keep the blue crank at about seventy percent, and watch what happens. It kind of works. Isn't that the stupidest thing you've ever seen? So that's the importance of choosing a color and like sticking with it. Just stick with the... Yeah, just kind of stick with it. Stick with the one color that you choose. And like, you can't really go wrong. Because that looks fine. Like, I I mean, it's still kind of gumpy, but like, that's way better than it was. And let's say, okay, you wanted to warm that up instead of, well, I don't like the blue. Maybe I want it to be kind of that, that brown color. I'm going to come in. Same thing. I'm just going to fill it. I'm going to get my uh, fill bucket. And then I'm going to three, two, one. We'll give your eyes a minute to adjust again, but then you're going to notice something. It all kind of ties together, sure, but if I bring up the Warhammer artwork... I don't know about you, there's something pretty similar about how these pieces look. And I'm not just talking about these pieces. I'm gonna, let me bring in some, like, full-on, I have a terabyte folder of just Warhammer stuff. Um, let me bring in, load, load images, boom, boom, art, inspirations. Let's do this one, this one. Even some Magic the Gathering art. We'll do both. We'll do some uh, Warhammer art and some Magic the Gathering art. Um, and Bayard Wu. Let's bring in Bayard. And... Find one more. Yeah. Great. So, I brought in all these. At a quick glance, okay, so let me explain what these are. So this is Bayard Wu. He made this as a personal deal. But you can see the mother color is probably either that blue or that green, right? Probably that blue, because if you look at how everything has kind of been kissed by the blue. Andrew Marr, one of my favorite Magic the Gathering artists, his stuff is dope. Of course it's red. I mean, it's a red card, so of course you would glaze it with a red. That makes a lot of sense. And now here's some really kick-ass Warhammer art. But you notice, it's glazed. It's like, it's totally... Even this red has a little bit of the yellow in it. Because if you look at the highlights, the, the kind of the warmer neutrally yellow highlights, right? Same thing here. Everything is kind of made with that. Here you have that nice orange. That orange is kind of hitting everything, including like the slightly brown shadows here. And, and then this one, of course, is blue. Literally, it looks like they painted um, <laughs> and then just put the blue filter like I did, and which is cool. It's a great way to work. That's one of the best benefits of digital. Is if my art director came back and said, hey, can we make this a little cooler? I'll be like, oh, you mean like that? <laughs> like, instead of having to go in and redo everything, you click a button and then there you go, right? Um, 
so yeah it's it's fun like that's why i dig digital man digital gets a bad rap sometimes but like being able just to on a whim be like well what would this look like blue what would this look like red what would this look like you can do that and as long as you're not one you want to work in layers this is a powerful thing about working in layers but you don't want to I don't know. You don't want to psych yourself up too much. My thing is, what I psych myself up a lot with, and it's not realistic, but here's a little inside the inside the actor studio type of thing. I think, which isn't necessarily fair, but this is what goes through my mind. I think, and this may not even be true, that the difference between this piece right here like this or this piece right here like this is on if I get a job or not. Which probably is not accurate, but that's how my brain works. Like, oh, this one's the nice warmer. This one's the nice cooler. Let me lower it down a little more. Like... Oh, if I post this one, it's good. But if I posted that one, that would get me the job. Like, I don't know if that's a healthy way to think. Maybe I should just make stuff, and if it looks cool, I post it up. Um, but, like, that's my deal. That's whatever I have to get over. <laughs> right? Um, but it's not that I'm worried about it looking right or whatever. Like, that part doesn't bother me. My part is, what is the most effective way to tell the story of the swamp? And that's what I struggle with. It's like, all these different ways look really cool, but what's the best way? And that's the hard... That's Those are the hard decisions, in my opinion. You know. So we got that. I think... It's looking... Pretty good, so if we want to... I'm thinking this is kind of our locked-in color palette. I, I, I like this one. It's soft. It gives the nasty, kind of grimy look. But it's not abrasive. Like, it's not... Um, oh, Aiku, what's up, man? Dude, I've been on a, I've been on a color theory tangent, my friend. You gotta. You you have to watch the uh, the playback. I've done some nastiness with these colors. <laughs> um, but that that's it, right? So this is I'm thinking the most effective use of the colors, right? I think that uh, I think I think we found it. So now. It's about refining these little details, like this type of stuff actually coming in. And I think really what I'm going to do, instead of working how we normally do with like, okay, let's work in black and white still, and then just kind of render and stuff. Now that we've quote unquote solved our problem with color, and now we have our colors in, now I'm going to use that as my underpainting, and on a new layer I can color pick and start doing stuff. So that's what we're going to knock out for the next probably 30 minutes or so, and then we'll then we'll call it a stream. Where's my pen? I went off on so many tangents that I like <laughs> put my pen somewhere. <laughs> Where you at, bro? Literally, I don't know where I put my pen. This is what it's like being 37, by the way. I'm like, I literally just had this item. There it is. <laughs> in my possession. It was in my lap. As you could hear it crashing. <laughs> Alright. We got this. Here we go. I'm gonna get back to our basic Photoshop brush. It is a sharper brush. So that will allow us to come in 
and carve away. You had like your channel has become one of my favorites to like I guess like binge just put all your videos on and just sort of have it on in the background because of the reviews and stuff and it's nice to be able to see and be able to compare them and it's cool And as far as my channel, I don't even know what the goal of it is at this point. I'm just like, hey, I'm going to make this video because it sounds neat. But I should probably try to get in on some sort of sponsored something. Actually, I love my Hueon. I'm, I'm pretty much a Hueon convert. I love Hueon. But, I'm at that point now where I'm like, I could get a 24 inch, right? Because right now I think I'm rocking the 20 inch. It's the Canvas 191 version 1 that came out, you know, years and years ago. But it says it's a 19 inch, but it's actually a 20 inch. Do a, I could probably do a 24 inch canvas, right? So, really, what I'm doing, guys, is I'm going in and I'm carving some shapes out. I'm using a harder round brush and I'm going and I'm making some just instinctive decisions about edges. And then I'm going over them again to kind of not blend them necessarily, but it's a technique in painting called broken color, which is where you put full opacity colors right next to each other and your eye will blend them together. Dude, Sung Wan Cho Pro ZD is hilarious. The guy's amazing. I remember watching, what was it, Anime High School or something that he was in? This is amazing. I like what, how he does. Um, I bought everything off the Taco Bell menu. <laughs> it's like you're a brave man. Actually, Taco Bell, everything's pretty good at Taco Bell. But there's some other stuff. I'm like, no way. No, you're going to try every type of Pringles? Really? I love his uh, voice acting stuff. Some of my favorite things is whenever he makes fun of card games. Because I love card games. But he's like, oh, whenever you're explaining a card game to your friend. And it's all gibberish. And I was like, yeah. That's, uh, that's true. See, like here, I need to come in. There we go. Let me get some of these harder edges on there. See, and what I want to do, I want to keep some of these. super sharp because I really want to sell that idea that they're like 
falling into the fog and the mist of the background. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to keep some of these. Some of them it makes sense that you can come in and like carve out, but... But yeah, I mean, I'm hoping, because I always feel more comfortable doing landscapes, I'm hoping I should just level up my landscape work, but that includes buildings. Like, I'm going to start painting more buildings, I think, because I think that's definitely a weak point of mine, but making the landscape around it look appealing might help cushion the blow a little bit. Um... Because, I mean, like we've talked about a bazillion times is, you know, I'd love to make card art or D&D, like, art for D&D. I think everyone in this business would love to. But I'm like, maybe with my, uh, I don't think with my characters I have a shot at all. Like, I really, I'm, I don't think I'm very good at that. Like, painting people, um, unless it's a like portrait and the person's in front of me, I can do that pretty good. But, once again, it's because I was trained in college to do it. Like, I did hundreds of them. And, like, I understand the theory and the, you know, technique of it and all that stuff. But, I just don't have that imaginative, imaginative spark that you need to really get to that best level. To be, like, a character artist for Magic the Gathering or D&D. But maybe... I can do it with a land card. Maybe. If I keep pushing. Keep improving. I can have a swamp card. Or, you know what I mean? Like a... Oh yeah, we can, we can add some little bits here. Like hanging off. That's cool. Keep those. Keep some of those sharp. I'm just gonna I'm just come in, come in and carve a little bit, you know. Yeah, what's up? Good to see you, Brent. Trying to come to terms with more uh, landscape stuff. The nice thing here is. This stuff doesn't really need to make sense, necessarily. As long as it looks okay. Instead of using like the foliage brushes, I'm just gonna like scribble on grass. <laughs> you know, it's kind of. <laughs> Texas news, that yes, it is, man. I appreciate you being here. Hopefully, work's going okay for you. So, I've kind of done. Um, comic book characters, sort of. The only thing is, I don't know if it's just my my understanding of anatomy is not where it needs to be, which is probably true. I think that's true anyway. Hell, I don't think my understanding of landscapes is where it needs to be. But something about doing comic book poses or something like that is I get so caught up in the drawing of it 
I feel like I can't paint it. Which is a misnomer, because I know there's a lot of, like, graphic read painters. Hell, Andrew Marr is one of them. Like, if you want to look at his, uh, illustration here, I mean, he's one of the best magic artists in the world. And, like, that's kind of a cartoon cover, or a comic book cover, I should say. You know what I mean? Like, but if you look real close, there's paint everywhere. I mean, this dude, these are paint strokes. He may do a pencil sketch to get it in, but, I mean, he painted this. You know what I mean? Like, there's no... There's no mistake. So it's doable. It's definitely doable. Like, Jamie Jones is another one. Jamie Jones is incredible um, for, like, his graphic read stuff. For whatever reason, my brain just can't do it. I can't disconnect. Like, here are the big, cool shapes, but also it looks painterly. Like, I can't bridge the gap. It either has to be one or the other. And I don't know what the holdup is. I wonder... It may be because of my training. I was taught very early on to never use line to suggest something that color could suggest or a paint stroke. Could, like, do not rely on lines. And I think I got it so far into my brain that it's actually a disservice now. Because every time I'm like, oh no, I'm getting a little too liney. It's a little too line work heavy. Like, the closest thing I'll do to line work is kind of what I'm doing right now. I'll grab a brush, and I'll come and I'll, like, sketch type things. You know? i just kind of come in and this sort of thing. And then, like, I'll break up big shapes. With kind of this nice, uh... Maybe right here, you know? Maybe hit some of that red. And maybe here. What's up, John? Good to see you, brother. Um... Yes, exactly. And it's funny you mention music because it's like I'm uh I just got my guitars out again and I need to start practicing again. Because I played guitar for like eleven years. I did open mic nights and bands and all that stuff, but once again I was always like the blues guy. I can do blues because blues is like four chords and twelve bar, you know, minor harmonic scale and you're pretty safe <laughs> you can always play the you know E chord in the key of E and it's going to sound right but what I'm really I, I bought a uh, set of neoclassical lessons about learning how to do more of the you know um, harmonic minors and stuff like that which is what I my ear always likes it I've always liked it the best, but I've just never been brave enough to try it. So now it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> After taking five years off of playing any sort of guitar, let me let me learn neoclassical heavy metal. That sounds doable. <laughs> you know. Impresses me the most, and I know this is a weird thing. Conan looks awesome, the compositions look great. It's the backs of all of the uh, the people like coming at Conan 
or Conan. It is absolutely Frank Rosetta. Like, the back muscles being the way they are, and like the, the traps, and you got the like rear deltoid, and you got like these flexed elbows and arms out, and they're holding axes and stuff. It's, it's perfect. They nailed it. They picked the right people to nail the, uh, that sort of like weird, goblin y, anatomy, stringy, sinewy muscle. Like, oh, it's so cool. I was like, it, it looks like a super vibrant, you know, almost a Marvel version of a Frank Rosetta painting. It's really cool. value. These two really dark values do not make sense. I thought they did. They do not. I need to temper them a little bit. So I will get the Photoshop wet brush. I will get that. And I slowly introduce a little bit more Saturated color there. I do like that shape, but we'll do this. There we go. So I just did, I said it at the very beginning of the, uh, of the stream, but what I like to do sometimes is what's called the wave test. Um, it's also called the reading test. Basically, focus somewhere on your painting. Like, let's say you focus like right here. And just keep your eye lock there. And then see if there's anything in your peripheral vision that jumps out at you. Or like, it's waving at you. Like, hey, pay attention to me. And whenever I did that, the thing that I noticed were these two dark areas down here. So that's why I kind of subdued those down. Um... Kind of blur that, bring that back. But it's a good way to make sure that your your overall stuff is balanced. Like it it, it feels um like not one specific thing is taking over that you don't want to. Of course, you want your uh, you want your focal point too. And now what I'm doing here, another nice landscape painting tip. You want to invite your viewers into the painting. So what that means is you don't want any, um, you don't want any like, perfect example, this old photo texture right here. I need to get rid of all of the spots that have detail right near the border. So I'm going to grab this, I'm going to subdue these down, subdue that down, put that in. Basically I'm making this to where there's not any harsh anything by the border that would impede you from if you're starting at the very bottom and looking up into the painting, nothing that would block you from continuing to come into the painting. We have something like that. So now, Out. 
see, I'm still using a brush, so it still has color and everything on it, but it's almost like blending, like bristle blending out this other stuff, which is what I want, really. And then... So nothing too harsh at the base. Right. And what this is going to do is really make sure that your viewer's eyes start coming into the painting. You can also do this around the edges here, which is the, where the term vignetting comes from. Um, you can vignette your your viewer back into the painting by keeping all of your um, Thanks for hanging out Phoenix. It's awesome um, See you brother. Appreciate you We're gonna vignette around the edges and blur out some of the edges That way anything around the edges are not gonna catch attention And not really going to catch a lot of attention so it's going to keep us in the painting it's going to keep the viewer in the painting same thing here same thing here sort of refine in some of these shapes. See, I'm hoping this one will be good enough for the portfolio. That's overall the goal. I mean, all told, I think we probably spent about six and a half hours on this one, you know? I'm sticking zoomed out a little bit so I can sort of get a feel on how it's reading, you know? Yes. So, yeah, these blurs are really... I guess you could tie them into composition. It's how is the... Um, how's the viewer's eyes kind of going around? And does it get stuck on any specific thing? And if so, why? And do you want it to be stuck there? And like, So, like, perfect example. I need to do something about this diagonal. Because, like, this is almost a broken line, which is cool. I like that. But I really want it to be more influenced coming up this hill right here. You know, like this sort of... I really want that hill to, like, read in and kind of blend in there. Because I want you, as the viewer, to not get hung up on anything. I want you to be able to, like, walk through the swamp. Which sounds goofy, but it is what it is. Um, the more likely you would be to traverse this area, the more likely you are to keep looking at the painting. 
because it's like you're visiting there. You know what I mean? Yeah, having a cool sorcerer would be dope. But I'm trying to get away from like just putting random figure in my landscape unless it calls for it. You know what I mean? natural now oh my goodness <laughs> mostly moist thank you so much I appreciate you um a lot of it is kind of a second nature thing now but I will say what I always try to do I don't really like to think of it's weird Whenever I do a landscape, I don't think of my composition left to right and up and down. I think of my composition as far as depth. Like, I would literally... Like, I could... If I had, like, a little sketch thing open, I could probably make you a little map of what this is from the top down. Like, if I was in a helicopter looking straight down at this, this tree is gnarling and, like... Actually, let me try to do that real fast, just to show you how my mind thinks about this. I think of depth way more than I think of anything else. So I'm like, okay, if I have this, I have this, I want, draw the eye in. yes. So yeah, it all kind of wants to lead you in, like I still need to fix probably these values right here on this bigger branch but really what this is is let's say we're right here we're right here and we're the viewer this structure probably starts right here and then goes back like this there's some stuff up front here which is this there's another big tree which is this right here but there's also coming out of the ground there's something coming like this it's like a trail I think of like here's some steps or something basically what these are some rocks and then I know it's probably really garish and hard to see on this so I apologize but this and then just a lot of little nuances but the further I go back the more yellow I want it. The more I want it to f to make sense in the context of the depth of what we have for the light. I basically try to make a set. Like, I think of it like a film director. I'm like, okay, where's my shot? I'm like, what's my camera? What's my lens? Um, my... It's bad. And I'll, I'll show you guys something, and you guys will probably never see my landscapes the same way again. I have one thing that I need to break the habit of. Bring this over here. Every single one of my, and some of you, if you're a long time watcher, you probably already know this. So all of my landscapes have um, diagonals. But they're all diagonals. Like, Literally, it's almost like cutting the composition, you know? It's like, there's my diagonal right there, and then, uh, like, this one's a little less, but it's because, you know, Wrath and Glory, they kind of yelled at me about it. Well, they didn't, but I noticed it, so I swapped it, but like, diagonal, diagonal, slice of light, diagonal, um, <laughs> diagonal, coming across. Diagonal, coming across, diagonal. 
all of my stuff, diagonal diet, like, I need to get away from it. You know, and like, even in the sketchbook stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> the staircase, diagonal, like, I hate to call it a crutch. And even here, look, diagonal, the same thing over and over. Um, <laughs> it just is what it is. Like, diagonals work, triangles work. They're a time tested thing, and that's how it was taught. So it's hard to shake it, you know? Um, but it's not just know it's something that I'm always thinking about. Like, oh, am I getting too iffy on the, uh, you know, am I getting too diagonally again, or like what's going on? So it's something I'm always trying to balance out and grow and get better at. Yeah, see, and that's the thing, is like, yeah, it, it does make sense, and I do it for a reason, so I guess it's not all bad, but... Um, oh, here's another thing. So, uh, actually, on the same point about depth, giving depth. Let's separate this branch from this branch right here. We kind of already started, but let's really refine that. Let's grab this exact same fog color, and then outline... right here right and this is just kind of a soft wet hard round brush just very little opacity very little and then actually you want to grab this little bit of light back here kind of nuance that do the same thing right here too there we go. Kind of disconnect those shapes a little bit. And then what you're going to see is your eye is going to kind of like fill in the gap and make it seem like there's more depth um, in, the, in the whole thing. Actually, let me get rid of that one a little bit more. I don't want it to look obvious that that's what I'm doing. So I need to get rid of all of the edges. Any edge, I need to kind of get rid of it. And we can do that. There you go. And what that does is see how that kind of separates that even more. See you, Brent. Thanks for hanging out, brother. It's good to see you. Have a good shift. And see, even that, that, that actually did a little bit. That did a little something. It brought... It... It... it it separated what we were looking for, but it made the, the shape read better overall, you know. And it's not a perfectly harsh line. It's none of that stuff. Um, you know, but it's just, it, it works. It, it definitely works. Being able to add a little bit of fog here and there uh, does aid in making a piece read to have more depth. So I'm gonna get some of this color and bring this down because I do want some of that tree right there. Softer, but Kind of real gnarled, you know. And, and it's funny, the exact same thing we just did with this, we can do with a few of these to really start setting that uh, that swooping sense of like weird decay inside of the tree. So like this, like it's kind of going in, you know? It's cool because it's almost like the tree's made out of bone marrow or something. Like it's a really weird, oh my goodness.
Araya? Araya? I'm terrible with names. Um, thank you very much for hanging out. I'm just kind of putting, I guess, what you would consider finishing touches on this. This is one of those that you could render for, I don't know, 8 billion years. But I wanted to keep it loose. I wanted to keep it more, uh... gestural because I think that's more interesting to look at in my opinion it's just cooler to look at you know less can be more um it can be I think every piece is its own puzzle that you gotta you know every painting has its own needs you know living breathing uh, <laughs> sense but but yeah you can Less is usually more effective, I'll put it that way. Um, like, it can, it can be stronger. Perfect example is like, you know, John Singer Sargent, Andrew Zorn, Edgar Degas, you know, that type of stuff. Whenever you look at their paintings from nine feet away, they look perfect. They look super rendered and stuff. And then you walk up, and then you realize you're living in a bunch of smudges. Like, you're not, you know... It's the very impressionistic way to go. And I think that's stronger, in my opinion. Um, I'm going to do that. Because I know I've been pulling up Warhammer art all this time, but that's what I kind of look at. And you start realizing some of these pieces that are just like astronomically good and you look at them and you're like, whoa, look at all that detail. And then you zoom in and there's actually not a lot of detail. What's up? How you doing? Thank you. It's coming along okay. Like, I need to probably add some more jaggies and stuff to the inside of there. I don't want to over flatten it. Um, or over uh, smooth it out. You know? Which is why concept that yes, totally. So no, you're totally right, because now the viewer has to do something. If everything's really um <laughs> Hey, what's up plastic? No, I haven't swapped to Clip Studio. I just use it a lot now for more render stuff. But dude, I still use er, like look at all this. I got well that that old one's open in Photoshop. Photoshop, Rebel 5, Rebel 6, Clip Studio, Art Rage, Paint Storage Studio, Krita. Bro Painter, Project Dog Waffle, which I'm going to do a, a, a video on this soon. It's pretty rad. And then the Realistic Paint, um, I do have the Glaze Anti-AI thing. I have two or three other programs I need to install. Um, Adobe Fresco I have installed, and I'm going to look at that too. But, uh, but yeah man, Mike, I use them all. They all do something good, you know what I mean? Um, so, let me pull up the uh, Warhammer stuff. So yeah, there's Andrew Moore. Here we go. If I look at those three movies over. So, beautiful piece, right? Like, I've done a study of this piece, actually. But, it looks like there's so much detail. John, thank you, brother, man. You are the real MVP, dude. Um, but, like, you see these just jaw-dropping Warhammer pieces. The stuff that, like... this is, I'm going to train my whole life for this type of stuff, right? And you zoom in. Wait, wait a minute. There's actually not a lot of detail here. You know, like, those are the teeth. But like you look at it and it's not really not really teeth. You know what I'm saying? What's up, B Solar? And then like the chains. Chains are kinda dirty. A little a little smudgy. You know? And like just basically the light is hitting the form. And that's it. And like even the axe, the cuts and the scrapes are just squiggles. 
You see what I'm saying? Like, and even on the more Sylvaneth Rune Lord stuff, the tree branches, you're like, man, those tree branches are sick. And then you look and you're like, oh, there's only like two values, three colors. It's pretty, yeah, it's, but like right here, this is tree bark, but like, you can see the squiggle, right? It's really interesting. Um, I've learned a ton studying Warhammer art. I've learned a ton. These are like master classes. Yes, exactly. None of it looks like it's not done. None of it looks like it's missing something. It all has balance. Like, back here, this is either a spaceship or a shuttle or something that's back behind here. But look, there's like five brush strokes maybe for this. Then you see kind of the light catching that. You see the, the light catching this, but that just squiggles. Like, this is the goal. So it's not necessarily that, like, less is more. But you don't have to worry about everything. You don't gotta worry about it, you know? And, like, here's the... The terrain. I shoot myself in the foot. Yeah, time-wise, yes. Super small, totally. Yes, that's, um... That's, the, yeah, doing card art for Varia broke me out of that habit real quick. Um, one of my favorite Less Is More digital paintings, let me bring it up. Photo image. Duratan. Okay. This is one of the sickest paintings I've ever seen, right? You look at this and you're like, good God, I could never do that, right? Like, I know I, look, whenever I look at it, I'm like, there's no way. And then I started looking at it, and I was like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. None of this is rendered. Like, the face isn't rendered real. I mean, it kind of is. It has really good uh, value, really good value control. But, like... There is not a refined line on this entire piece. Look at this. Like... You can see every single texture. Every single... You see what I'm saying? Look at that. That's stupid. Like, that's so good. So you look at it and you, you're like, okay, I don't know what this is. And then you zoom out and you're like, holy God in heaven. Like, what? <laughs> this is like, this is a master class of just, you could study this one thing for five years. And like, you're going to get something out of it each time you look at it. Like, oh, that's why he did the colors that way. That's why he did that. And here's the other thing. It works well. In grayscale, because the values are right, right? Because, like, the brightest, of course, is your light source. But the second brightest is the same brightness as your light source, which is the, the fur catching the highlight, right? So you start putting these puzzle pieces together, and then it starts making the thing. Oh, for sure, yeah. I mean, I bet they were, I bet they were about right here painting this. And they had like three or four brushes they kept going between. Um, and another thing, I bet they did not work in black and white. They worked in color. Um, because there's no real way, in my opinion, that you can gradient map your way into something like this. You just can't do it. Um, the way these colors are interacting... Yeah, like that purple. You wouldn't get these colors that way. Th this was painted completely step by step, item by item, layer by layer in color. Right? This is how, I mean, there's no other way to do it. 
The only thing that I'm like, well, maybe they did, is if you look at, like, right here. You see how that is kind of a bigger beveled version of what's inside of it? Yeah, see, I need to do some more hard round brushes. Um, that's kind of, I mean, not totally, but like, that is kind of what we went for here is more, okay, use the wet round brush and then the normal round brush. And that's about it. And then you photo bash a little bit and then, you know, figure it out. But, but yeah, I think getting more comfortable with the, uh, with the, uh, Oh, the, the tool set is just better, you know. And this gave me a great reason to break in the new version of Clip Studio. <laughs> Thankfully, they did their thing where it's a perpetual license. I got rid of that, all that subscription crap. They still have some of it, but... But yeah, seeing work like that just inspires me to come in and keep painting, because I'm like, oh man. Maybe if I just do some cool things here and there, it can start to look like that. You know, maybe even the values are pretty close. You can, you know, that type of stuff. Kind of leave some of those brush marks out of there. This one was more of the Underworlds Warhammer stuff. And I think we've achieved something that looks like it. Um, at least it has that same sort of personality. Uh, because kind of what we're going after is like this sort of gnarlwoody... See, that's what I need to do. I need to bring in some weird bats or something and, like, put them in there. Corel Essentials. Dude, Corel Essentials is great. Corel makes, Corel makes some mean products, man. They're really good. I know I, I blasted them on YouTube a little bit because I don't think Corel Painter needs to be $400 to just drop 400 bucks all at once. I don't believe in that. Um, especially when there's other programs that you can get for literally less than a fourth of the cost and it does stuff pretty good but dude Corel Essentials is amazing Krita if you haven't tried it it is free to download I highly recommend it um kind of has everything you might need you know and all it takes is time um Yeah, so we're going after this, and see, this one is a little more detailed. It does have some more chalky brushes. It has a little bit more texture, but also you have this really cool... I love how the uh, the environment is the main star of the show, because you have your characters here that are, like, blended in. Their values match the, the surroundings, so they blend in really well. Super smart way to do that. Rebel is, yes. So Rebel, I want to say Rebel Pro is like a hundred and fifty. I don't know, do they have two different versions for Rebel 6? The standard version might be 80, and then the other one's like double the price, I think. Um, which is totally, I, for what it gives you, I think it's a fair, I think that's a fair jumping point. Um... While it's true you only have the one version of Rebel, you may not need any more versions of Rebel. And uh, Art Rage is the same way. Art Rage is like 60 or 70, and I think that's a pretty good one and done as well. Um, so yeah, we got those. Like, this one's really cool. We have those. And see, I was trying to go in after, like, this is the actual playboard for Warhammer Underworlds, which is a game I really enjoy. I don't get to play it as much as I want, but 
They also come with these really dope uh, rule books that have a lot of really cool art in there. Um, and then I was showing them off earlier, but yeah, these are the minis it comes with. And holy crap, these minis are sick. <laughs> I already have mine all painted up. But like, in a perfect world, I would be doing art like this. Like, I would be uh, working on Warhammer Underworlds. Thankfully, I've already worked with Warhammer a few times, but I want to work on Underworlds, man. That game is so fun. <laughs> and then, of course, our Andreas Roca piece we were kind of inspired by for that slice of light. And then Adam Paquette, who is an absolute savage. This is an old swamp painting he did. I think this was 20... Where when was Cons of Tarkir for Magic the Gathering? Like 2015? This is one of his. He's a demon. He always has been. But even he, like, yeah, he has some texture filter or some photo fi filters uh, textured on here and all that stuff. But, uh, even still, you can see the loose, loosey goosey brush strokes, man. Same thing here. Kind of defining these shapes. It looks sick. It looks so good. And then here was some of my reference. I didn't really use a lot of this. I used some of it. Me? Yeah. Me? Yeah. Anyway. Um, this one might be close to finished. I want to fix this. In fact, let me be a good artist and use this reference that I pulled. So if you ever want to know how I use reference, this is it. Um, since I am an observational artist, I literally try to bring in exactly what I see. So, so really what I like to do let me turn this into grayscale. That way I can just see the values. That's all I care about. My main tools, yeah, man. I need to do more procreate. There's a guy, um, <laughs> I say it like I'm in the mob. There's a guy making a brush pack. Uh, there is a guy making a brush pack. And <laughs> it's really good looking traditional oil brushes. And I am super stoked. Super stoked to try them out. On procreate. So I'm gonna follow some of these shapes and notice how the light is hitting and then you have the harsher shadows like right here kind of making these shapes. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna come in and I'm just gonna kind of dot in some of these, right? Kind of match those same colors. And then we're going to go back over it with the more wet brush. Let's see, I need to do the more symmetrical, or not symmetrical, geometric, geometric shapes. Break everything down into like, this is kind of a rounded oval, kind of an oval right there. Kind of more of a rectangle with some squiggles in there. S curve, and then connect in some of these. We have that. Now, I'm gonna look at the darker lines. There's a lot of like S shapes, Z shapes. And then we're gonna get the other brush, the wet version of this brush, and connect the dots. So we're going to do 
this. Bigger wet brush, grab that. Gonna blotch in some of these. Get rid of some of those harsher. more interesting at least um, I might need to lessen the darkening on this and smudge these in a little bit more to kind of fit with that bone motif that we have up above Something like this. on my uh, stylus is getting squeaky now. Means I need to change it, but... Okay. I have that. So, a nice painting secret, and I learned this from James Gurney. If an edge does not have to be hard, like if it doesn't need to be a sharp edge, make it a soft edge. Like, go out of your way to soften the edge. Because it's going to allow it to look a little more painterly. And I think that's really good advice. And I've been being more, like, mindful of it. And I will say that it has had a pretty substantial positive effect on my work, in my opinion. Um, that everything just looks a little bit more cohesive, like I meant to do it, instead of just these crazy, like, happy accidents. Which is basically what this is. This is basically happy accidents, the painting, you know? Um...
kind of reintroduce that green a little bit here. Kind of tie that foreground in with that background a little more. And then also I need to get rid of that real harsh difference in values. I think we're pretty much good to go here. Let me make that shape a little more interesting. Get rid of this tree. Oh. Let's make this a little more interesting to look at. So right here, I'm just going and I'm adding some shapes to really kind of define the other shapes, which sounds silly and it kind of is, but do this. A little more detail, a little more depth, just something interesting to look at around where the brightest highlights are going to be. Thing is, you want to be real careful about your values here because you don't want to break that optical illusion that you have. You know, that's why I'm kind of color picking stuff right around where I'm parts of the painting, I am very much like a color pick fiend. Like that's how I can tell when I'm at kind of a grand finale of a piece is if I'm color picking everything and making small little squiggles like I'm doing right now, the piece is pretty much done. This is just busy work for the sake of it, I guess. for the audience to be able to like stand that's the other thing as human beings we like to I mean I don't like to leave the house but in theory human beings like to discover and we like to travel which is why video games that have big open worlds are pretty appealing right because you can go places I've always learned in a landscape have some places where the viewer can rest. If they were on this adventure, have a few small little areas, right, where you could see yourself, like, with your little travel sack. And then if we zoom out, this should look a little stronger. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what the hell's going on over here, but <laughs> it is what it is, right? Uh, unless you balance your drawing and painting. Some people are not very proficient with drawing, but their painting skills is the next level. Um, yeah, I don't get to balance them very well. Um, it's a different thing. I'm used to using shapes and colors to show light. I, I'm a big fan of painting light and shadow. That's how my brain works. So drawing does not come naturally to me. Um, I can okay sketch, but really my sketch is more of a means to an end of like, this is where I'm gonna put my shadows. This is where I'm gonna put my, you know, I'm thinking ahead to the painting whenever I'm drawing. Drawing for drawing's sake, I wish I could, but I can't. Like, that's probably just not who I am as an artist. Um, I wish I was, for sure. But, um, 
yeah, I don't, I can't wrap my head around it. I can't really balance it. I, I use it as a means to an end, and that end is painting. I bet if I got better and more comfortable with drawing, I bet my paintings would be better. Um, I bet they would make more sense because then I could design and solve all the problems during the drawing and then just kind of quote unquote paint by numbers and put in the stuff and then oh there it is you know and then you can of course maneuver stuff around as you get paint in there but you know I, I think it's just a different skill set it's a wholly different part of the brain it's funny I've actually um you know, my daughter did a little art class at a library recently, and while she was in it, I, uh, I read, um, the library's copy, or parts of it, um, read the library's copy of Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain, which, the science in it is outdated now, because, you know, the brain, the brain does have two hemispheres, but the whole left brain, right brain thing doesn't hold a lot of merit anymore, but... It's still a great book to read to break down the process of thinking differently. Just like, you know, perfect example is a lot of her students, she would teach uh, drawing the negative space. You don't draw the chair, you draw the shapes around the chair. And then whenever you look back, you'll see the chair. It's like the vases and faces thing where you see the vase and then on the two ends of the vase, you see faces, and you're like, oh, which one do you see? I see this. Do you see that? It's talking about negative space and about designing shapes. And I think that is very important. Like, very, very important. And it's something I don't do super well, I don't think. Uh, it's probably something I need to get better at, you know. I need to strive to achieve better shapes and I think hell that's probably why I'm not able to lock down like the Magic the Gathering clientele you know what I mean like or, or get on the art director's radar my shapes just probably aren't right they're probably not good in that capacity which is fair you know I ain't, I ain't butthurt about it it's just <laughs> if it is what it is you know that's that's uh what happens but it's always something on my mind. It's like, how can I better utilize the stuff that I'm weak at to hopefully not be weak at it anymore? I'm gonna bring a little bit more light in. And then what we can do Grab that bright color. Let's make some little bubblies. Let me get this Photoshop brush. Sharpie sharp. So now we really have some of these. But we can also And it looks like that this wouldn't do a lot, but wait till we zoom out. These little water reflections, I just basically just uh, got the color of the light of the lightest part. And I'm doing kind of a, a refraction pass, I guess. So I'm using the hardest brush I have right here just to kind of block this in. And maybe get some of that light on there. do we'll even do some of it right here connect these sharp kind of razor blade brush in the 
mug here. Bring in some of these for sure uh, shapes on the rocks. We'll keep that sort of board out. That's fine with me. We do this. Then I'm gonna grab that wet brush, make some bigger strokes around here and softer. And what this is gonna do is this is gonna give us that swampy, nasty, like, you can feel it on your shoes type of stuff. Right? Cause that's the whole thing. Our whole goal with this is to be an immersive, nasty swamp. Like, we want this to be an area that kind of looks pretty in a weird way, but you don't want to explore it because you get all the dirt in your shoes, you know? And then, something that you probably noticed that I haven't done, even though there's a little bit of standing water, like swamp water, is reflections. Like, I've done refraction where the light hits the top of the water, but I'm not, like, mirroring what's above the water in the water. And the reason why, I don't know if this is even true or not, but when I think of nasty swamp water, I don't think of, like, the beautiful mirror image type stuff. I think of, like, there's so much gunk floating around there, you can't see anything. Oh, that's cool. Let me do some diagonals. Do that. Yeah, so now we're just kind of joining shapes. If they're close in value... Let me just kind of like... Clean them up slightly. Make them a little more interesting. It's funny, I haven't even used my blender brush yet, but I don't think I'm going to need to. Um, I just like to use kind of the soft 
softer hard round brush as a blender brush because it lets everything kind of take the colors that you're providing. And then depending on how hard you press down, more of the color that's on the brush is going to transfer. like it's going inside and around and truly like gnarling in, you know? two together. Yeah. Get some more um, contour shapes. So I mentioned this earlier, but whenever I think about contour shapes or shapes that define the form, I think of if I'm wrapping the thing in saran wrap. Like mentally, that's what I picture. And that usually does a pretty good job of telling me where to put building on that motif about the uh, how the bones are kind of swooping in and around and all that stuff that's kind of what I'm doing everywhere else so I'm like these little negative areas and kind of doing that same thing so hopefully it all looks fairly cohesive thing about trees, even if they're like fantasy trees, the further away they get from the root, the more thin the limbs are going to be. You can get away with a few things where it kind of bulbs out and stuff, but like normally as it gets further away from the root, you're going to get way more thin. I did an okay job at doing that, but 
Just a thing to remember. Alright. I think we are about done. So that's one, um, Elder Zakharov, I already had the Elder Zakharov brushes, but there's a new guy, his name's Max, I can't remember what his last name is, but he his, his are called like the Max brushes or something, but the oil painting ones he's working on right now are stupid good, like they look real, they look actually real, it freaks me out, um, so let's see, actually let me get rid of that. jumped out at me a little. Same thing there. Any of these little ones I'll other. Okay. All right. Yeah. There we go. It's looking, it's looking pretty good. I might consider this one done. I mean, every other thing that we're going to be doing with it, I don't know. I don't know if it improve it or just change it for the sake of changing it or whatever. But yeah, like, I'm pretty pleased with that one. I think it'll do good on the, uh, yeah, I think it'll do good on the portfolio. Let me see if I can uh, pull the Duder's brushes. Um, oh, yeah, his name is uh, Max Pax. And then, Max. Precise. He has not released the oil ones yet, but let me. Pull up. Let's show you the students. Uh. Okay. So his name is Max. Um, Cindy. Oh, yes. These are the oil brushes he's working on. Um, they're like insanely good. There's another... There was one thing that he showed, and it's just the brushes kind of on their own canvas. Um, not that one. Not that one. That one's pretty good. That one's kind of absurd. Um, where is the other one? He does some like nice cool on warm brush stroke. This is it. When I saw this, I flipped out. I was like, are you kidding me? Because this, the, the darker edges right here and how the darker edges like grab onto the contour of, that is such an oil painting thing. And there's not really a software, I even did the Rebel versus Art Rage stuff that can quite get that look. This looks like they mixed um, oil paints with like 
Gamsol. Or liquid. And it has just enough paint thinner that you can see the bristles. But not so much paint thinner that it turns into like a weird watercolor thing. A very nuanced thing. Um, but yeah, whenever I saw this, I was like... You gotta be kidding me. Um, it, it's so hard to explain. I just hope they feel right. It's one thing to look good, right? It's one thing to look good, but I want it to feel right. And that's the, that's the thing. That's the thing. But, yeah, I think that's our painting. I think I'm gonna post this one up. Um, Post this one on the old socials, on the old portfolio. Kind of call this one done. I'm excited. I think my next set is going to be, um, or my next landscape, is actually going to have a figure in it. But I would like to do a Titus Lunter style, kind of, kind of a person in a dungeon looking at a huge deal. But do it in like a three-fourths kind of fisheye perspective really break out of my habits of flat one dimensional or like one vanishing point type stuff I need to really start like and I'm going to build it in 3D I'm going to build it in 3D I'm going to try to figure out the best way to make it work um I might even like trace over the uh the, 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 the geometry hell I might just light the whole thing. I might do it all in 3D and then just use that and like use it as a photo bash template or something. I don't know. We'll figure it out. I, I just want to make something that's a cooler look and angle than what I normally do. Because I think, you know, even though I'm really happy with how my uh, rendering is coming along and like how I can get depth and feel and, you know, colors and all that stuff. I still think my stuff's a little boring because it's just a flat look. Like, you see it, it's kind of flat, it has depth, but there's just one dimension, kind of. What I need to do is really get that 3D look. I need to get that and start solving those problems. But that's something we can do on another stream, um, for sure. But I want to thank you all very much for um, hanging out. Let me this sorry if it does a weird thing <laughs> there we go I know that's weird it's out of focus and it's blocking my head but it is what it is <laughs> here let me let me bring it down here something like that and then let me turn down my iTunes all right there we go so that's it. That's our stream. We have been going, we've been live for three hours. Three hour stream. I did not expect it to go three hours, but I'm glad it did. Uh, thank you all so much for hanging out. Hope you had a blast. Um, I love doing landscapes. I could do landscapes every day for the rest of my life and be totally happy. Um, I just need to get better at them. I need to get better at them. Um, just hopefully there's more work to get just doing landscapes. I think that'd be really cool. Um, something I've been thinking about is, um, probably in the fall, um, once <laughs> schedules situate and stuff like that, I might try to do an oil painting stream. We'll see how that goes. If not in the fall, probably 2024, we can get one going, but, um, need to break out the old, the old oil paints. Start doing that some more too. Um, but that's it, man. That's... That's the old, that's the time. It's my time, you know. Three hours, had a ton of fun. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you to all the new followers. Thank you um, for everybody hanging out, uh, doing your thing. And also huge, huge thank you to John Neal for that $12, man. I appreciate you very much. Uh, thank you for the support. And hey, let me know if you guys have any questions on socials, on the comments of this video. If you're watching the archive, glad you're watching. Thank you. Um, try to join us live next time. It's a lot of fun and um, a lot of cool chat and hanging out with everybody. Cool community. 
But that's my time. I will catch you guys next time uh, on the live stream. Till then, peace.